Hello, hello, and welcome to Hygiene Elevated Conversations and Innovations. Uh, we just had our one year anniversary of podcasting. Woo! We are very excited about that. Um, seems like a lifetime ago, yet just yesterday that Joffrey said, Hey, what do you think about starting a podcast? So here we are, <laughs> one year later. Um, anyway, so we wanted to thank everybody for tuning in and listening to our podcasts. Thank you so much for your support. Um, we couldn't do it without you. All right. Our goal has always been to learn and share information with other dental professionals. And today we're shaking things up. This time we have our number one fan on with us, um, Spencer Herrera who surprisingly or not surprisingly is not actually in the dental field. Um, Spencer provided some really great feedback for us a few months ago and suggested that we get some patients on the show to give a patient perspective on, on things, on dental things, right? So no better way to do that than to bring Spencer Herrera on the show herself to be our very first patient perspective episode. <laughs> so this is our way of kind of giving the dental professionals, like Joffrey said, um, of the patient perspective, living with Sjogren's syndrome. So Spencer, you have a wonderful restaurant here in Salt Lake City with the best burritos, in my <laughs> humble opinion. Um, not related to your condition or why you're on the show today, but we wanted to bring you on to give us your perspective. So introduce yourself to our viewers, who you are and what your condition is and how it's affected your life. Okay. Well, thank you for saying that. I think you have the best podcast ever. <laughs> so the feeling is mutual. And I'm really honored. I had no idea that this was your 100th or your one year anniversary episode. So I feel very fortunate to be here today. Um, also, thank you so much for taking my feedback into actual consideration and doing this because I mean, I listen and I love, I've listened to all, but I think the last two podcasts and that's just because of work-life home balance um <laughs> but you guys use kind of like complicated dental jargon that I don't really know what you're talking about but I go to the dentist all the time so I do find a lot of it very interesting um and on that I go to the dentist all the time because I have Sjogren's disease so I've had an insane amount of dental work done. Um, but before we get into that, I do, I own a restaurant in Holiday, Utah with my husband. And it's just, I don't mean, I don't even mean food wise, but it's just the best place. We have the best community. I love my staff. My friends that I met 10, 15 years ago, all, we all work together. Um, and we're just so lucky to have a team that we trust and to actually profit before our fifth year, which is not common for a lot of restaurants. And I'm also really lucky because I had a baby in 2022 and my staff is just so fantastic that it's given me an opportunity to stay home with him about 80% of the time. I just am able to work from home. Um, so I'm with kiddos a lot. My husband and I, like to be outside as often as possible. We have recreational property up in Fruitland that we like to go to and camp. We have two horses that we just got that we're so excited to take out this year and just do lots and lots of trail rides. And yeah, that's me. <laughs> I, well, I'm jealous of your recreational land up in Fruitland. That is beautiful up there. Very yeah, beautiful. It's it's great. Um we we grew up hanging out up there, so it feels really special to introduce it to my kids as well and keep it going through generations. That's awesome. Yeah. So Spencer, tell us, let's talk about kind of what brought you onto our podcast okay. and 
kind of your your impact of your autoimmune issue that you have and what it's like in your life. So what were some of your earliest symptoms and what was the process of getting that diagnosis? When did you get it? Um, that's a good question. So I had a, a, a couple of complicated years as a child. I was just tired all the time and had no enthusiasm for about a year or two to go play or to participate in any other activity. And then I developed a rash on my face. And so my mom had expressed her concern for a while just about my general level of fatigue. Um, and then when the rash popped up, I was taken to the pediatrician and we found out that it was called the Mylar rash. And it's one of the telltale signs that you have either lupus or Sjogren's. And so at the time, all of my blood work kind of indicated that it was more lupus than Sjogren's. So I got that, that, that was when I was nine. I'm sorry if I forgot to mention that. And then at age 10, I got the diagnosis for lupus. And so with that, I always felt like my parents were very, um, cognizant of what was going on with me. They like kept a really close eye on me and my behavior and my health and my attitude. And I just, I didn't feel better, even though I had been taking medication for about three years. And so I had, I, I don't know if this triggered it or what happened, but from my experience, when I got my braces on at 13, my mouth just all of a sudden became really, really aggravated. And like my gums were terribly sore all the time. And they told me that that was pretty typical of getting braces and that it would go away and it would get better, but it, it didn't. And then I remember my uncle had taken me out to lunch and I was trying to eat and my salivary glands became so clogged that I was just in a horrendous amount of pain because they were clogged shut, but also trying to push forth saliva into my mouth so that I could oh. eat chew. And I just remember my face, like right underneath my earlobes swelled up. And this is not an exaggeration, a little bit larger than golf balls. They looked crazy. And so my mom, like I said, because she always was on top of my health, she um, was like, "You, we need to take you somewhere. We got to figure this out. So I actually went to an ear, nose, and throat doctor, and they did a biopsy from each cheek. I don't recall them biopsying my lips or my tongue or anything like that. It was just like in the deep pockets of my cheek. And then it came back as Sjogren's. We didn't know what that was other than it was a disease our pediatrician and our pri or our um, rheumatologist had mentioned three years ago. So the, the care when I got that diagnosis was really basic. Um, my rheumatologist just said, you need to constantly hydrate. I want you to be the girl that everybody recognizes as having a big water bottle. That's going to be your new image. You have to have to hydrate. So I thought, okay, I can do that. That's not an issue. And so I did that for two years. And I would still have the occasional flare-ups where my salivary glands would become clogged and painful. And they, like, gave me tips on how to treat it. I could put hot compresses on it and kind of rub it and milk the saliva out. But, I mean... It, the pain level is just outrageous. Mm -hmm. It hurts so bad. So when I went to get my braces off, I think this was at age 15. So I'm two years into the Sjogren's diagnosis at this point and five years into the lupus diagnosis. Gosh. The craziest thing happened. Um, they use those tools to take your brackets off and all in the front, I'm, I, I did write teeth numbers down, but I forgot to write these ones down. But my front six from canine to canine, the enamel started coming off with the brackets. Oh, God. And it was painful. And it if like throughout that day, as I was breathing in the air, it 
it was like the sensation of nerve pain. So, um, what are the braces doctors called? Orthodontists. Yeah. So the orthodontist said, you immediately need to go to your dentist. I don't deal with this. I don't know what's happening. So I went to my dentist and I, I love my dentist. I have had the same dentist since I was six or seven years old and he's still my provider now. I just love, love, love him. And he has taken such great care of me. But when we got there that day and we had told him what happened with the braces, he, he's basically was taken aback and said, this doesn't make any sense. What is going on here? And he asked my mom all these questions. And throughout that process, we told him she has Sjogren's. And our like my rheumatologist never told me that this was information that I needed to share with my dental mm -hmm. provider. We didn't know because again, I just needed to hydrate is what I was told. So when we found out that I had Sjogren's, he was really shocked said that that explained everything that was happening. Basically, my mouth had became um, too acidic. It like, I guess you're supposed to have alkaline acidity levels in your mouth. And my mouth was just terribly, terribly acidic because it's constantly dry. And my teeth were just rotting away. I was having bone loss, um, gum recession, I would get cavities all the time. So I'm sure a lot of your listeners already know this, but um, I'm not good. Like I said, the dental jargon is hard for me, even though I do go to the dentist all the time. <laughs> You're okay. doing great. You're doing great, Switzer. Okay. So <laughs> basically, like people with Sjogren's, if they eat any sugar whatsoever, that the decay just has nothing else to attach to because your mouth is so dry all the time. And I was a child. So we were eating candy at school lunch and stuff like that every single day. And basically just how much decay I had in my mouth deteriorated uh, most of my enamel. Um, I had 14, 15 cavities when I went into this visit this is when I went through all of kind of my dental trauma. So the only solution for the enamel being torn off, I apologize about the train. I live on the West side. Um, the only solution was to, you know, take it down to nothing and put crowns on. And so I got six crowns that, that day, like six temporaries, went back two weeks later, got six real crowns. And I love them and I think that they're beautiful, but <laughs> because my experience with having braces was so unpleasant, it really felt like such a waste of time if I knew I was just going to get beautiful, white, perfect, fake teeth anyway. But how could we have known? Um, so that happened. And then just throughout the years, like I said, I have the best dentist. He taught me how to take care of my teeth, uh, what mouthwashes to use. Uh, he wrote me a bunch of prescriptions for fluoride, for mouth rinse, for toothpaste, for stuff like that. And I really feel like I've actually tried since then to take care of my oral hygiene. And yet it still fails me all the time. So at this point, this is what I wrote down for you guys so I could give the listeners what they're after. <laughs> the only, I, I, tell me if I'm wrong, though, because I'll feel so bad about it. Um, I only have teeth at the bottom. Does this make sense? I have 23, 24, 25, and 26 that are still real. Okay. And crown. Those are the only teeth I have left that do not have crowns on them. Wow. And I actually just consulted, and I'm about to go get crowns on them. So... Within a month, I will have no natural teeth. Natural teeth, yeah. Um, but crowns are not a permanent solution, as you both know. I've had to get several crowns replaced. I've had to have several root canals. I've had root canals fail, where I've had to go to the root the root canal guy who does <laughs> the surgeries on the ends. I've had implants put in. I've had implants fail. I have. I had implants fail and then I had bone grafting fail. Um, I've had dry socket. I, I have just been through it with 
dental work. Gosh, Spencer, um, thank you for sharing your story. Um, I'm so sorry to hear of all of your, your diagnoses and how, how much this impacts your daily life, not just your dental health. I mean, obviously we all know that's our passion, mm -hmm. our dental health, we know affects our whole health, but our whole health affects our dental health. Mm -hmm. And you, you gave us a lot to unpack in that, that intro. I think one of the biggest things that stood out to me as a dental provider and hearing you kind of say, you never knew, like your rheumatologist never knew that she, you needed to tell your dental provider that you had Sjogren's yes. um, because maybe it wasn't manifested nearly as bad or something that you never thought about telling your hygienist at your dentist appointment. Um, but it clearly had a huge impact. So that breaks my heart. Because I know there's still kind of this gap between the dental world and the healthcare world where mm -hmm. for whatever reason, people don't think the two are one. Yes, oh. we treat things differently, but you know, it's not like we don't need to know those things. So it breaks my heart to hear that, that a step couldn't have been taken to help prevent, especially knowing when we have patients that go through ortho, holy cow, that it compromises your ability to clean things so much mm -hmm. so uh well, okay so spencer yes i want to ask you so i was under the impression or a lot of people listening might be under the impression that being diagnosed with lupus is something that happens to like older women maybe in like their 40s but yeah you were diagnosed so early mm -hmm. no you're correct i i just have a specific genetic makeup. My dad has lupus in his family and I just was, I guess, at a higher risk of getting it. But you are correct. About 95% of people diagnosed with lupus are 45 or older. And women especially, women get diagnosed more often and they especially get diagnosed during premenopause. And it's also more common in people with more melanin in their skin. So like you would see it pre predominantly not in um, like Northern European, which is where my family comes from. We, but randomly I got it. Wow. And then um, Spencer, you've spoken like so highly of your childhood dentist. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to give you the chance. Go ahead and give him a shout out. Tell everybody who it is. Oh, who did so a good job for you? So his name is Bruce O'Donohue, and it used to be the Oral Health Center. I think it's, he changed it. I feel really bad. He just changed the name, the Oral. I don't remember. If you type in Oral Health Center, he's in Taylorsville off of Redwood Road in 4500 South. He's fantastic. But the reason why I, I like him so much is I just never felt like he was ever taking advantage of the situation as in never. Oh, let's just crown all of them because I'm sure that would pad his wallet a little bit. I felt like he always took a very gentle approach. He's tried to keep me with as many of my natural teeth as possible. He's taught me a lot. I, and because I do see a lot of providers, there is a difference in the level of care that you receive based on people's experience or personality or whatever. And he is just very kind and professional and has taken really good care of me. Um, I want to jump back for a second. I don't think I ever realized that with uh, Sjogren's, you, they have to do biopsies. Um, I yeah. didn't realize that. They was that something specific because you were getting those swellings in your glands? That's a good question. And I don't have a specific answer. I do know that I, that going for the biopsy is a faster approach to getting a diagnosis because both with Sjogren's and lupus, you have to have, I don't know how many it is for Sjogren's, but for lupus, you have to have 11 indicators in your lab work. And Sjogren's is very complicated to diagnose as well. And they're especially complicated to diagnose together because so many of the, sy the symptoms overlap. So fatigue, brain fog, uh, rheumatoid, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, 
poor kidney function or kidney damage and um, gastrointestinal. Those are all, those are six symptoms that lupus and Sjogren's share. And so I feel like until that happened that day and had that not happened, had my salivary glands never swelled up, we, I may not have ever been diagnosed. They might just be like, girl, you need to brush your teeth. And like, we wouldn't know <laughs> what was going on, but yeah. luckily we went to a good specialist and I, I think, but it's hard because that was 20 years ago, but I think this was the biopsy was just the faster route to get um, to the root of the problem. That's so interesting. So in the dental profession, we see, we see a lot of dry mouth um we that's the number one side effect of all medications Mm -hmm. um but how does Sjogren specifically affect your day-to-day life and Mm -hmm. what do you kind of do or what have you found that has helped you kind of manage those daily symptoms okay that's a hot topic. So this might be little, <laughs> I ask all the good ones, all the hot topics. This might be a little long winded. Um, okay. For a long time, it didn't feel like anything helped. And I hate to saw anyone's name or anything, but for a long time when I was going to providers, I just got told the same thing you're a mystery. We don't know. You have Sjogren's, you have lupus. I be, I got misdiagnosed with fibromyalgia. I got misdiagnosed with brain lupus. It's so complex that I think even the professionals that deal with it have a hard time dealing with it and getting it under control. So day-to-day life, the way that it affects me, dry mouth. My mouth is so dry right now. It gives me a lot of social anxiety because I think sometimes people think I'm drunk because I sound kind of like slurry and just mm-hmm. different. And that can be really hard when I'm working or doing job interviews or even just hanging out with my friends. There, there's such a social element to having chronic dry mouth. It's awkward it, and it's uncomfortable. And it's hard to stay present in the moment when you're, you know, just so aware of what's going aware. on with you. Yes. So there's that. Um, But Sjogren's is so interesting because it doesn't just dry your mouth. It dries everything. So Mm -hmm. my eyes are terribly dry. Last year, I went through the diagnosis process and got diagnosed with glaucoma because with dry eye, you get deterioration of your optic nerve. And so I've just had um, my, you know, my eyes have been affected and it, the hard, the hard part with glaucoma and dry eye, like I can't wear contacts because my eye is too dry. Like they just won't allow for it. Um, glasses are hard. I, I don't want to wear my glasses all the time. So I kind of just, and I know this is so nonsensical and, but that maybe I'm just a little goofy in that regard, but I walk around with blurry vision all the time. And like, I still feel safe enough to drive or work or use my computer, stuff like that. But I don't, I don't see clearly. And then the other thing, um, because everything is so dry, I take a medication called pilocarpine and I take five milligrams, five times a day. I just pop them all day long because they're supposed to help your body create moisture. And I'm grateful that there's a medication out there, but those side effects are silly too, because you get full body sweats. Like I sweat all night long. My hair gets greasy really, really fast because I take it. My face appears oily, even if I've just cleansed it. Um, but my mouth is still dry. So, you know, me and my rheumatologist have weighed the pros and the cons of that medication, but I'm just still taking it because if it is helping in ways that I'm not aware of yet, I'm just going to go ahead and do it as a precaution. Um, what else? Yeah. Just other stuff. Like my blood work, it always looks crazy because of my Sjogren's and actually Joffrey to go back to your question, how you were saying most people get diagnosed with lupus like pre-menopause where I got diagnosed so young, I have kind I've been told 
but I've seen a, a lot of different doctors that my lupus is in remission right now. And it's actually my Sjogren that is so highly active. Oh. But this, like I said, a lot of the symptoms are very similar to one another. So I always have poor kidney function. Like that always looks low. I always have protein in my urine, which they don't like that. I, I've just had a lot of internal health issues and it actually got so severe that I'm now a patient at the Mayo Clinic. I don't even really deal with my local providers anymore. I fly to Minnesota to get health care because wow. they, they have time to study it. And I'm not trying to discredit anyone, but a lot of the hospitals here are turn and burn. They have a million patients a day. They're dealing with insurance companies. I mean, even just to get an appointment with my rheumatologist, it's six months out every single time. But once you're in the database at the Mayo Clinic, you can get an appointment similarly to how you can get an appointment with your dentist within like a week or two. Wow. That's, yeah. that's a huge, a huge impact. Um, I think, you know, we're in the dental field, so we're always thinking just like kind of with these blinders on of like, Oral. And honestly, even when I asked you the question, like, how do you manage your symptoms? In my mind, I was thinking, oh, she's just going to tell me dental. Um, and you gave me a much better overall picture, which kind of shows my bias. I'm always thinking just dental and not thinking whole person. Mm -hmm. Like I was just speaking against a couple minutes ago. Um, you know, when we're making recommendations for patients, we're not necessarily always thinking whole person. Yeah. So, um, gosh, Spencer. Well, on that, Amanda, I don't think it's totally our fault that we're not thinking of the whole person. Not it's so not many is as open as Miss Herrera here, who it's true. will share all the details. Some patients <laughs> think we only need to know about the details in their mouth. And so it's hard for us to piece this puzzle together without the pieces. Yeah. yeah. That's true. You're the best patient, Spencer, because you <laughs> tell us everything and it's like, oh, maybe I don't need to know that. But so much practice. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're you're able to get to the Mayo Clinic. Um, my little cousin, um, gosh, she has had more hospital bracelets in the last year than I've ever had in my lifetime. And she still doesn't have a good diagnosis. They basically just say her digestive system is failing and have nothing to offer her. Um, it's awful. They're, they're not giving her any like, hey, maybe you should really focus and change your diet, um, which yeah. is something I think you should be telling a 20 year old to really work on your diet. But anyway, she's finally getting into the Mayo Clinic system and I'm, I'm very yeah. optimistic and hopeful that she can get some help with them. So they're fantastic. They'll, they'll figure it out. Ugh. Hey, Spencer, are there any misconceptions about Sjogren's? Um, honestly, I don't think enough, I don't think enough people know anything about it for there to be misconceptions other than the only person that I know that's a public figure that has spoken out on Sjogren's is Serena Williams. She has it. Really? Yeah. And it's affected her and her ability to play tennis. I, I don't I imagine. It does, but it, she has extreme rheumatoid arthritis. And she actually did an interview. I don't remember who it was with, but probably celebrity gossip trash because that's what I love. <laughs> He did some interview and she actually talked about what it's like to have Sjogren's. And I just related so deeply to her oh, because wow. she was telling me that like athletes, not me, but she was telling me that like athletes in her industry are just like, oh, you have Sjogren's. So you're just a little sleepy. You're just a little tired. You'll be okay. Have a cup of coffee. Because with a lot of autoimmune, I think the first thing people think is fatigue. But there's so much more than that. Like, I can't imagine having to be an athlete on a professional level, dealing with the press, having a family, doing all these things and getting told you're just tired. And it's kind of the same thing with lupus. People just don't know anything about it other than like George Costanza made a joke about it on Seinfeld in the 90s. 
And like, um, I'm not a fan of hers, but what's her name? Selena Gomez has it. Oh. And so I, like I said, I love celebrity trash. So she had to actually <laughs> get her, her kidneys replaced. What? Yeah. And that, that's the same thing with Sjogren's too because a lot like i said a lot of the symptoms overlap with one another and nephrology is like a big big thing and i've been told stuff like that like oh you have too much urine in your protein oh your your kidney function is too low oh we really need to start thinking about this thinking about that and it's just crazy that as patients we go through so much heartache and other people just think oh you're just a little tired oh. gosh Okay, I I definitely clearly am not in the celebrity trash world. Um, you got to get into it. <laughs> I feel like maybe we you should just do a podcast and update us on all the celebrity like health conditions so I've, we can be in the know. I've thought about it. <laughs> um, okay, we'll who was this goes? This might be my launch pad. Your launch. Okay, who was the tennis star? Venus Williams. Serena, her sister, and I couldn't imagine star. how unstoppable she would be if she did not have those conditions. But I think that that's why she is unstoppable. I think when you are constantly fighting internal battles and pushing harder and harder and harder, you do build up this tough exterior and. And I, I think I'm kind of the same way too. Like I make it such a point when I go into to work, to work the hardest out of anybody that's clocked in. I like to be the most productive. I like to be the most optimistic, the most positive. Joffrey ate at the restaurant the other day and then we spoke on the phone and she told me, you are so crazy and high energy at work. And I'm, I'm not, it's a, it's a facade because I can't, I can't be the other option, which is sad, tired, brain foggy. You know, there's a lot of depression and anxiety associated with Sjogren's. I, like, I can't. You, you, you can't walk around like that. And the people that do are unbearable. <laughs> there are some really, really ornery people out there. It's very That true. are dealing with their conditions. That is so true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Spencer, um, that... Honestly, um, your perspective is so phenomenal and encouraging and honestly insightful. These are, I didn't know what necessarily I thought I was coming into with this podcast, but um, I really appreciate your perspective. As a provider, um, again, you know, it's easy for us to kind of get disconnected. I can feel sympathy or empathy for a patient. Um, but kind of hearing a little bit more of your story, your daily life, and just the the mental struggle and the physical struggle that you go through, um, it puts it in perspective. So I really do appreciate you sharing um, what you've been through, um, kind of how you're living your life right now, dentally, but just your whole person, not just your teeth story, yeah. even though that's such a, you know, a forefront for us. So Thank you so much for that. I, I really appreciate it. Absolutely. I'm happy to share. I'm an open book. I think it's important to talk about this stuff so there's no stigma around it. I think it's okay to admit you don't feel well and talk about it. Yeah. As long as you're not crotchety about it. <laughs> Attitude is everything. I think it is. I mean, that's fine. You can be crotchety. People are in pain. People are suffering. I don't want to take any of that away from them. It's just not who I am. Yeah. So Spencer, What's when, that? you know, any of the dental providers who are listening in and when they have their next patient come up, who's wrote in Sjogren's on their health history, yeah. I want to know from you, like, what should we be recommending to our patients? What have you found help and relief with? And what have you tried? Because yeah. what you've tried isn't necessarily what's worked. Yeah. Okay. I'll try to go in order in the way that you asked. If you were a provider and someone came in and had Sjogren's, even if you just had a couple sentences or something of education to tell them, because like I said, there's a disconnect between rheumatology and the dental world. You know, they're not, 
they don't share medical records with one another. They don't talk to each other. It's totally, they're different. So I, I think, I think as even someone with the disease, they're not going to know a lot about it. So I think it would be great if providers had a little bit of information to pass along, even if it was just basics, such as, uh, you know, like avoiding sugar, using fluoride, writing them prescriptions for the, you tell me what it's called, the good mouthwash for dry mouth, like, you know, stuff like that. And like another thing, because Sjogren's just loves decay so much and loves to destroy your teeth. You have to be very intentional with your oral health practices. So like, I don't brush my teeth for two minutes. I brush my teeth for four minutes, two minutes on the top, two minutes on the bottom. You just have to, you have to get rid of as much decay as you possibly can. Tell them that, let them know this is going to take a little bit more effort on your end, but it's going to be worth it in the long, in the long term. And then things that I've tried, a lot of it's been counterproductive. So when my salivary glands get clogged, because they still will if I'm having a flare up or if I'm dehydrated or something like that, my rheumatologist has told me suck on sour candy, a a lemon head, something to pump that saliva through before the gland can like fully clog and you have to go to the ER or somewhere to get it taken care of. But like, according to my dentist, that's the worst thing that you can do for your teeth as a Sjogren's patient. Because like I said, the, the acidity, the sugar, the decay, they just all like party when you eat candy. (laughs) And I'm going to start saying that they party, man. Yeah. (laughs) So (laughs) what was the the last part? I'm, I apologize. Sorry. We threw you off. That's okay. Um, What things have you tried? Oh, what that have worked and haven't worked. I mean, the hydration thing is important. Always have a drink on hand, just something, especially socializing. If you have dry mouth, because like I said, it can be awkward and make you feel uncomfortable. I always like having a drink. Um, there's like the good gum and the good mints. I think they're the xylitol ones, not the sugar ones. So those are good. (laughs) They kind of keep your mouth a little bit more lubricated so you you aren't so dry that you can't talk. I don't think that they help. I don't think that that's like the magic elixir, constantly just keeping your mouth moist because stuff's going to come up anyway. But pilocarpine, for some patients, they get amazing results. Like I said, I'm feeling the results in almost every other aspect but my mouth. So maybe I'm just an odd an odd case on that one and then there's also immunosuppressant medication that i've taken that have worked i've done steroid treatments that have worked but the problem with i think what's hard to accept like i view like providers as problem solvers. You know, they want to get you a prescription. They want to figure it out or dentists want to drill it out, fill it in, fix it. But the thing is, is that there's no fixing this. This is a lifelong challenge. Your immune system is never going to repair itself. Your Sjogren's is never going to go away. So I wish I had better advice on what works and what doesn't work, but I think it it is so individual and go and it, it, it's on such a case by case basis that I don't really have a great answer. I, I appreciate your answer though, because I think you're right. It's not about um, finding a solution to the disease necessarily, but kind of managing your symptoms when you're dealing with something specific like this. I think for me, I always try to find like the root cause, but if there's not a cure to the root cause that I can address, then I think managing those symptoms the best as you possibly can and finding what works for the patient yeah. because it's so individualized is the best thing to do. And I've, I've have a couple patients that have dry mouth, not Sjogren's. Um, and I will tell them, I'm like, we're going to have to try a lot of things because I can tell you what research says from this specific company, but I don't know what's going to work for you. 
Mm-hmm. Because yeah. this isn't something that I can try it at home and tell you, oh, it's awesome. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know. Well, and a lot of it is trial and error, but it, everything is worth trying in case something sticks and something actually works. But I will say if there are people listening with Sjogren's or providers listening that have patients with Sjogren's, get them to get dental insurance. Like you need care for this. You can't go untreated. Get dental insurance or get a care credit card or whatever you have to do. Take care of your teeth. Like, especially with all the bone loss and the gum recession that's associated with this, you have to start thinking long term. It's not just on my tooth hurts today. I'll go get it fixed. No, girl. You need someone that's going to take care of you long term and have your back and get a plan and, you know, move forward with a good provider. Um, I want to ask you a quick question, not really a quick question, but you were mentioning that you've had some um, implants fail and yeah. dry socket and then um, bone replacements that have failed. Yes. Uh, what were those situations? Like kind of what was the timeline within your diagnosis of that happening? Um, oh, Sorry, I broke my back and it's hard to sit here. Um, Okay. So timeline, I had the incident when I was 13, when all the enamel came off, but I just had not just, but it didn't require any oral surgery. I just got crowns put on and, and, you know, hit or miss here or there, crown to crown, root canal, whatever. And then my, my front tooth, my front left one, started hurting and it hadn't been root canal it had only been taken down to put the crown on top so he did the root canal and then it just it didn't heal right i had it like i got a lot of infection um i had to take a lot of antibiotics for it that's is it an endodontist that does the root canals okay so he did the thing where he took like the tip of the root canal off under anesthesia And I was just still in so much pain and they couldn't figure out what was going on. So they took the whole tooth out, gave me my first implant. That's fine. Whatever. Um, But then I started having. How old were you at that time? I 16. Oh, so you're young. Wow. Most 16 year olds don't have an implant. Oh, yeah. Well, I think I have seven implants right now. Um, I can't, it's hard to remember what's implanted and what's crowned, but so after that, I just had the same thing. It would go from root canal to the, what is it? Endodontist to the (laughs) endodontist, to the tooth, just having to come out so uncomfortable, so much pain, so much infection, get a post, get a crown. And then I had the same thing happen on my back, right? So I had a bridge there for a really long time because it was like a solution in between uh, what they had done to getting an implant. We knew I was going to get an implant, but I was getting implants so frequently for a number of years. Um, I went, the guy that I go to for my implants, his name is Kyle Christensen. He's in South Jordan. He kind of wanted to watch and see what happened to the two teeth that were holding the bridge down. Because if we were going to, like, do it and go in, I guess they have options. If you have several teeth that are implanted right next to each other, they they perform a pr- the procedure or the placement different or something like that. I, I don't truly know. But the, the, other two, the other two teeth held up. So we decided to just go for it and do the implant. And it fell out. Like, I was just, I was older when this happened. I was 22. That's still very young. Yeah. But we'll continue. <laughs> so, I, do either of you have implants? No. So they, no. They, they're flushed while they heal with the gum. If it's the front tooth, they'll put a, a temporary on it so you're not walking around hillbilly style. But this was flush with the gum. And I would like fill it. I'd be like, it feels loose, but it's in my bone. It's not supposed to be loose. That's so weird. And I was actually working at this coffee shop at the time and just like talking, sucking through a straw, drinking coffee and boop popped right out. And I like looked at it and I was like, Oh my God, panic. So I go back to him. It's like, we can't, we can't, we can't 
immediately put a new one in. That's when I got the dry socket from that healing and doing its thing. Oh and dry socket gosh. is terrible. And then, so after everything had healed up and we were going to make our second attempt, the the rate in which I had bone loss was so insane. It, we probably waited about three months in between the initial implant and the second attempt. And then when he went in and they put me under... They were, cause I can't, they'll do it while you're awake, but I cannot handle that. And so they put me under, everything was a go. And then as soon as he got in there, even he was taken aback by the amount of bone loss that I had in such a short amount of time, couldn't do it. So since I was under, you know, you just signed the thing, they can do what they got to do while they're in there. They did a bone grafting. And so when I woke up, they told me, Hey, couldn't do the implant today, but we did bone grafting. So as soon as that heals, then we'll do it. Well, the bone grafting failed. We tried it a second time. The bone grafting failed. Then we went to try it a third time. And there's different methods. I think it's like cadaver bone and what? Do they have like fake bone that they use or something? I don't know. Bovine. Usually okay. it's bovine. Oh, okay. Well, anyways, it just wouldn't take. And I was in so much pain for so long. <laughs> This is crazy. I forgot all about this. So I worked at Java Joe's, the coffee shop. And I think that like my work experience there, those people must have thought I was so insane. Because <laughs> I was so, my mouth is dry. I sound drunk. My um, bone grafting is failing. So I'm taking lore tabs, like just so, <laughs> like in a, in a constant stage of suffering and I think that they thought I was crazy and I ended up quitting and that was fine <laughs> so who cares but <laughs> who cares what Java Joe's thinks yeah. <laughs> this is like, it's funny now but this is like yeah. one of the sides of Sjogren's that people don't see like going through all that and still having to go to work and perform and be normal and whatever <laughs> sorry um, <laughs> It's it's tough, man. So anyways, I still don't have a tooth there. Let's see. It's number 18. Mm. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I would assume so. I mean. It's not the back one. It's the one in front of the back one. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. You had a bridge back there. 18. Yeah, I'll go with yeah. that one. So I still don't have a tooth, but I have a lot of like fear around trying again because my first experience was months and months and months of agony. And I'm just, maybe I'll get a retainer with a tooth on it. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I've been toothless for 11 years. <laughs> oh but, and it's funny too, because I totally chew on my left side because I'm missing a tooth there, but you just adapt the same way I'm sure people with dentures adapt or people missing teeth in other places adapt. But it is kind of, I mean, dental care is a luxury. Having all your teeth is a luxury. It shouldn't be, but that's like part of a much larger conversation about basic health care needs. But it is, it's weird to be missing a tooth. Gosh. I, I know I've already said it, but I just absolutely appreciate your perspective because it's it's so easy to lose sight of sight of what our patients are going through sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I remember in hygiene school, you know, we were learning to do what's called hard tissue charting, and that's chart like missing teeth, what fillings are present on what surfaces. And I remember thinking to myself, but who's missing teeth? <laughs> like at that age, I was like, who's even missing teeth? <laughs> like, is this a thing? Nobody's missing teeth. Like I was just ignorant, didn't know. Yeah. Um, but it's you, so, it's you very know. common, obviously. But. Yeah. Okay. So on that note, Amanda, I remember doing that in hygiene school very well. And my, we were all partnered up actually. So you, you were going to do the hard tissue on somebody and then they were going to do the hard tissue on, on you, right? Just yeah. to learn the charting. And the partner that I had did not have one single cavity. And I was shocked because I had so many, I mean, fillings and crowns and root canals. And I thought I was normal. Like 
I didn't realize that there was this whole group of people that never had dental work. So I was also feeling like a total dummy, like what? <laughs> no, you're not, you're not a dummy. Um, I mean, there's members of my family. My aunt married a man, perfect teeth, his daughter, perfect teeth, never a cavity. Their son, perfect teeth, never a cavity, only needed braces just to straighten him out. But there are people out there who were just lucky. Yeah. Um, okay, going back to hygiene school, I didn't realize I had maxillary tori. I just thought it was a perfectly normal thing until I was in hygiene school. Uh -oh. So that just means I have extra bone in the roof of my mouth. Okay. Um, she thought it was normal. And then I was like, oh my gosh, not everybody has that. <laughs> A magnet. That was me with my geographical tongue. I was like, my tongue is different. I thought everyone's tongue looked like this. Mine is geographical as well. Why it's, is that? It's just funny. Well, yours might be because of the autoimmune issue. Okay. I would guess. But it's funny how we all have something and it's just your perspective of, oh, this is just normal of what we yeah. live with because we don't know any better. We don't have that basis of comparison. Yeah. So it's, it's very funny. Mm. Well, you guys are sweet. I feel like you both genuinely care. I mean, you do this show because you care. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's You're not ignorant. Don't call yourself that. <laughs> At the time it was ignorance, but you <laughs> yeah. know, ignorance is bliss. So yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so Spencer, Yes. What advice would you give to others who are living with Sjogren's disease or those who um, maybe even just hygienists that will have a patient with Sjogren's disease? Like what kind of piece, pieces of advice would you give them to offer their patients? What advice would I give to a provider or to a patient? I'm sorry. Um, kind of both. I mean, I guess maybe go patient first and then provider giving care. Okay. So patient first, I would definitely say just be vulnerable. Tell the truth because you're not going to get care if you don't tell the truth. It can be hard to go to your dentist and say, yeah, I vape all day. I smoke cigarettes. I drink 32 ounce Diet Cokes because you know, they don't want you doing that stuff, but just <laughs> allow yourself to be vulnerable so that you can get taken care of. And then just on that, I think, I think providers are, I mean, doing the best that they can to their ability and to their education level. But I think listening is important. If you see a patient come to you presenting in a vulnerable manner, maybe take a little extra time to listen. I don't know. Can you guys run and Google something for them, you know, real quick and then go back and talk to them. Like, I don't know, but there, there's just, because it is so weird and not a lot of people have it. And like I said, not a lot of people have it that are white and that live in North America. And so this like lupus and Sjogren's are both more common South of the equator. So it's just, it's not, it's not something, it's not like diabetes. Everybody has that, you know, it's, it's, it's different. It's enigmatic. Like, I don't know. I don't know how to give a provider advice because these are doctors, you know, these are people who have worked so hard and put so much effort into education and critical thinking and, you know, trying to comprehend what their patients are relaying to them. And I think, I think it seems like a really, really hard job. So I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to tell a provider what to do. <laughs> no, but I think you still have a valuable perspective. Kind of like I was saying, like, you know, I can tell you all day long what research says for this, that, and the other, mm -hmm. but you're living that out. So don't discount your perspective and not discounting a, a doctor's perspective of all the research and hard work that they've gone through. But it's one thing to have a head knowledge of it. Mm -hmm. It's another thing to have a working knowledge of a disease. So that's that's my perspective. I love it. Spency, I'm so glad you came on the show today. Yeah, um, and I guys. With this being like our first episode of bringing a patient on and getting that patient perspective. Um, I want to close out today's podcast a little different. Um, today, I want us to just throw in a plug for your restaurant. So Spencer, take as much time yes. you want 
and talk about Fossil. Do you have a lot of local listeners? We do. You, you do? Okay. Hi, guys. <laughs> um, yeah. So my husband and I, his name is Dallas. He's such a talented chef. He mm -hmm. is like, people say that, right? You know, like they're the best. No, but he's the goat. Like literally he is. His creativity is next level. His palate is so refined. He's so smart and nerdy and creative. Like I just love his brain. I think he's such an artist and his menu is so beautifully curated and there's a lot of random elements to it, but when they're all thrown together, it makes sense. And I think, okay, first of all, I'll go on like a little rant. I think that there is a little um, prejudice around Mexican food. I think that people think it needs to be cheap. A lot of people will describe like street tacos as like dirty or like, uh, like what is it? What do they call that? Like uh, grease bombs or, you know, whatever. Oh. Let, or gut bombs or whatever. Like if you eat at the taco stand, you're going to get sick type of mentality. And I think that that is so incredibly racist. First of all, that's, that's my soapbox. Um, because they put so much love and effort and energy into their food. There's so much tradition that's in Mexican food. Like, you know, all the restaurants here, not all of them, but a lot of them rep farm to table. Well, in Mexico, the farm is outside and they brought it literally to the table. So that's just that's just their culture as a whole. Where here everything is outsourced. Cisco, Cisco of, is delivering to your door. Of chemicals, like all that stuff. So, anyways, with that said, and I only say that just to say, like, we're I'm Mexican, but he's not. He's Filipino and he's and part white. And a lot of people are like, well, we don't trust a white chef. But I mean, I think he's brown presenting. I don't. What do you think, Joffrey? You told me he looks like a. He has a beautiful olive complexion. Yeah. So he's not like white, white. But <laughs> and there's another stereotype. Like, don't go to white people for Mexican food. But I just vouch for him. He's so talented. Um, I feel as though I'm really good at what I do too. I am very, very good with customers. I like like. Uh, uh, we call it touching tables, you know, like just going around, making sure everybody's having a good time doing their thing. But more importantly, so when we started, okay, sorry, it's hard to talk about yourself. Um, it, is. it is very hard. <laughs> yeah. So he has a background in fine dining and that's fine. There's a time and a place, but we both we're very firm in our opinion that fine dining doesn't feel inclusive and that it feels like you have to have a certain outfit on. You have to know what wine looks like and tastes like and blah, blah, blah. Like I, I just am not in the mood for that pretentious dining experience all the time. And another thing that was important to us was we wanted to create a place that you could come with your family and that you don't you don't have to dress a certain way. You don't have to be a certain way. Your kids can be loud. We don't care. We just turn the radio up even louder. Like <laughs> so that was our goal with it. We wanted to bring a lot of like, you know, those those traditions and all like that level of effort that they put into their food in Mexico into our restaurant. We don't say that we're farm to table um, because that's I, that's not you don't we don't grow limes in utah like we don't grow avocados here like but we do source locally as much as we possibly can so we have a lot of really wonderful farmers that we support um just you know we like to keep it in the community as much as possible yeah. so i love that element of the restaurant it like i said it's inclusive it's fun but i would say the most important thing is it's delicious oh no 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 that's not what i was gonna say oh, i'm gonna say it's delicious <laughs> oh well thank you for saying that but we really just wanted you to come in and like feel a sense of community like where everyone is welcome 
you know, you can get something at any price point. You, that you could feel that the staff was happy, that people were there enjoying themselves, enjoying their job. Like, you know, we do a few things um, that I think are really important that maybe a customer wouldn't necessarily pick up on. But like, we have requirements for our staff. So like everybody gets greeted when they come in and everybody gets like farewell as they leave. We think that's really important. We go around and touch all the tables at least once during their dining experience. And it's like me or the floor manager that will do that. And then because it is counter service, we don't expect a tip. But because, you know, it's a lower level of service than a full service restaurant where you have a server coming to and from your table getting everything you need. A lot of our restaurant is self-serve. So you get your own water, your own silverware, your own utensils, napkins, hot sauce if you want it. We take your order, we'll bring you drinks, we'll bust your table. Um, so we get it, you know, and like we've hired our staff on, on a living wage so that they are not dependent on their tips, but the tips are just a bonus. So we have it so ingrained and it's a rule now that if anybody tips at the restaurant, you have to specifically say thank you for the tip. And then I, we always have to put something like personal on it. Like we really appreciate it or that means a lot to us or whatever. Because it is so expensive to dine out. And then when you're expected 20%, whatever, whatever people are up to, like that is a lot. Like, and one thing that I tell my staff all the time when we get large tabs, or even if it's a smaller tab, it doesn't matter. I think, I think it's important to look at like how many hours do you think that person had to work to afford their meal here? You know, mm -hmm. let's say they make $20 an hour, they spend 80 bucks. That's half of their eight hour shift that they just spent on us. Like that is such a luxury, honestly, you know, like for on us to on the receiving end of it. Like we're so we have so much gratitude for our customers for that. And so we I don't know, we just we really care. We care a lot. We care a lot about our staff. We care a lot about the community. We care a lot about our customers. And we care so much about the food. So, 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 so much. So speaking of the food. Yeah. What is your favorite thing on the menu? I, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have a lot of enthusiasm for the specials. Like if Dallas just whips something up. Like I said, he's just a, such a creative. I'm always like, dope. That looks good. It tastes good. It's so much fun. I love seafood. I love the shrimp ceviche. Anytime we do like a fish to, a tostada, it's fantastic. Um, but I did just want to add one other thing really fast. So like I said, I think that there is a misconception that Mexican food needs to be cheap and that whatever. So one thing that we've really incorporated, it was like the one element from fine dining that we took because we did not take anything from fine dining. Like, can I tell you a little story really fast? <laughs> or are we okay. out of time? Okay. Nope. So we did this event called Eat Drink Salt Lake City. And it's a oh, wonderful, yeah. yeah, and it's a wonderful event. And I'm not clowning. Like, if you love wine, I love that for you. I love tequila. Like, I get it. We all have our thing that we love. But so people were coming up from like really nice restaurants and would ask, well, you know, what wine do you guys have on your menu? And I was there with my best friend. Her name's Brittany, and she's also my general manager. Shout out to Brittany, by the way, because all the customers love her. She makes my life so much easier. She's just the best. But she's the best at these events because she's so personable. So I always make her come with me when we do this type of stuff. So anyways, we were both just like, man, we are so hokey because people would come up and be like, so what wine do you guys have on your menu? And we're like, um, I don't know if you've heard of it. It's called Boda Box. It's really cool. It lasts 30 days. And they would look at us and be like, why are they here? <laughs> and it's like, well, we're here for the food, not the drink portion of it. But I am really proud of our cocktail menu. I think it's really, really cool and fun. But, okay, sorry. Thank you for the anecdote. Sideway. <laughs> um, okay, the one thing that we did take from fine dining was artful plating. So I love the juxtaposition mm -hmm. of you come in, you get counter service. It's on a tray. But it is so beautiful. 
like when it comes to your table, it's so beautiful. That was really important to us. Because like I said, again, present things are expensive and presentation matters. And if someone worked half their eight hour shift to come dine with me, I want it to at least not only look good, but taste good. I feel like presentation has so much value. Um, so yeah, that's it. Fossil is in holiday. We're at, uh, what's our address? 4429 South, 2950 East. And if I I'm correct, Spencer, you guys started doing catering? Oh, yeah, oh, we did. Yes. Thank you for the plug. Yeah, so <laughs> we started out as a food truck, and a lot of people still, uh, you know, ask me about the truck, if we can come and do events with them. And it just seemed like such a missed opportunity to have to tell them no all the time. So we actually bought a taco cart and we'll bring the cart to your backyard, to your wedding, to your event, whatever. We can we can do a party of 10 or we can do up to 250 people. So just whatever you need, we got you. Um, I think my husband is actually going to order a ton of the pork belly burritos. Hmm. My favorite thing on the menu, personally. Um, it's so fantastic. Yeah, he's uh, as they get closer to their sale time, he's in the auction. They start catering their meals as it gets oh. closer. And he cool. fell in love when I got to take him finally. Cool, so, I love that. Um, I want to just shout out your bar menu because... That is my favorite thing on the menu. Thank you. That's I so have cool. had the opportunity to try many of your cocktails, and they were all delicious. Mm -hmm. um, but in the last little while when I've taken a sabbatical from alcohol, I could also say what beautiful mocktails you guys make. Yes, the Aguas Frescas are delicious yeah. and beautiful. Yeah, and everything is made in-house. We make our own horchata, our own agua frescas. We They're can, so good. We can do almost any uh, cocktail on the menu as a mocktail, but then we also have signature mocktails too. Um, mm -hmm. But that was like another part of the inclusivity thing. I, it, just because it's a taqueria doesn't mean you have to get shots and beers and drink tequila and get all wild and whatever. Come have a agua fresca. Buy your kids a horchata. You know, it, there there's something for everyone. Uh, I'm well, Spencer, to thank you so much for carving time out of your schedule to chat with us today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. This was really fun. When I when I start the gossip podcast, we'll have to insert a plug. <laughs> I love. Yes, please. You, <laughs> you owe us now. And, 